Is your diet coke carcinogenic? A leak to can your suggest so the it's a sweetener that can be found in thousands of products. Hey everyone, welcome back to another video on the channel. Today, I want to talk to you about aspartame, cancer and carcinogens. I've got my Diet Coke here and I think that the media and people have lost their minds in this whole report of it being added to the possible carcinogen list. Here's why. So on June 30th, the media released a story that aspartame has been categorized as possibly carcinogenic. I spent a great amount of time researching this for my clients and also for myself because I want my opinions to be based on evidence. The problem that I found with this was I couldn't find the actual report. And on recording this, it's now the 9th of July. I still haven't found the actual report that has been released by the IARC, which is the WHO, the World Health Organization's Cancer Research I think what's really funny about this and, and interesting is they don't want you to consume any sweeteners. They don't want you to consume sugar because that's like crack cocaine. What do they actually want us to do? And for someone that's involved in nutrition and the fitness industry, even for me, this massive overwhelm of information makes it difficult. It makes it really hard for people that aren't actually involved, that don't have any education or, or formal certification to know what to do and it creates this mass hysteria that we've all seen happen over the last week or so. So what does possible carcinogen mean? So the WHO was released saying it's a possible carcinogen but what actually does that entail? And what that actually means is there's four categories that the WHO's cancer research team have put together. What I'm going to do in this video as well, just so that you're aware, is I'm going to be referencing my laptop to make sure that the information I'm giving you is 100%. I want to make sure that absolutely everything, we're dotting the T's, sorry, <laughs> we're dotting the I's and crossing the T's to make sure that there's no confusion here. And there's, this isn't opinion. I'm, I'm purely referencing the data and what has been reported. So after a lot of research, what I found was uh, the best, the best report that I found was from Reuters, and it actually ran through a little bit more of the information. It ran through what the report was in terms of what was released by the IIRC um, and also the WHO. So just to make that clear, the IARC is the uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer and WHO is the World Health Organization. Um, and aspartamine, if you're unaware, is used in products Coca-Cola, shameless plug, not sponsored. I just am guilty of uh, consuming at least one a day. Also, uh, chewing gum, lots of low calorie things also include aspartamine and other sweeteners. And for years, it's been this controversial sweetener kind of debate around cancer, uh, but we'll get onto that in a second. So the WHO has four different categories that it will categorize items into based on their level of carcinogenic properties. Uh, it starts with group one, which is carcinogenic to humans. Group 2A is probably carcinogenic to humans. 2B is possibly carcinogenic to humans and group 3 is not classifiable as it's not carcinogenic to humans. And, and this was actually really difficult to find. Okay, I can find it through the WHO website, but then it's also not too clear on how you find the items that fall within each category. Uh, so I did find that. Group 2B is where the WHO and IARC have categorized the um, aspartame. So to be clear as well, it is the 9th of July and I still cannot find the release from the IARC. I don't think it's been publicly released. If you found it, put it in the comment section. I'd love to read it. But even now, it still isn't publicly available. So we will see when that happens. So what has been historically safe? So 
way back, this has been something that people in the fitness industry have debated and people who aren't in the fitness industry, what is natural? You know, a lot of the times you will hear people say, I'd rather consume the sugar, at least you know what that is, over the artificial sweeteners. And this is kind of this whole debate time and time again that really has had no backing. Um, apart from the just the, the thesis, the ideology that natural things are better than artificial things. And you might be sat there thinking, well, yeah, of course, Dan, like natural things are better than artificial. But it, it isn't actually as simple as that, because when we look at natural versus artificial is it, it I get it. You know, it sounds like that should be the case. But if we're looking at a compositional point of view, if we're looking at a, a health perspective, when you actually break down what we consume, a lot of the stuff that we consume looks like a chemical. You know, if you look at the, the, the vitamins and, and minerals of certain items, of all items actually, if you look at the labels, it looks like really long chemical formulas that are actually just perfectly natural substances. And it often doesn't make any difference in your composition at all. Obviously, we know that the overriding rule of composition is calories in versus calories out. So the JECFA, which is the Joint WHO Food and Agricultural Organization Experts Committee on Food Additives, that's a mouthful, no wonder they abbreviate that, um, since 1981 have said that it's safe to consume within accepted daily limits. This is a Spartanine. For example, an adult weighing 60 kilos, 132 pounds, would have to drink 12 and 36 cans of diet soda, depending on the amount of aspartamine in the be beverage, every day to be at risk. So in another um, announcement, the IARC spokesperson said that both themselves and the JECFA committee's findings were confidential until July, but adult added, sorry, that they were complementary with the IARC's conclusion, representing that the first fundamental step to understanding uh, carcinogenicity. That is a mouthful. English is my first language and even I was like, so I think basically what's happening there is this has been massively blown out of proportion, in my opinion. I think that this has been a real clickbait situation that it's missed the context that it needs. So if we go back to those categories, I found the list of everything else that was in 2B, which is where the WHO has recommended that aspartamine has been put. So in that I've just highlighted a few other things that are in that group. So 2B includes aloe vera whole leaf extract, carpentry and joinery, the profession, uh, pickled vegetables, but more predominantly traditional Asian vegetables, progesterone only contraceptives, and talcum based powder, uh, perennial use only, so it's uh, over a long period of time. And then 2A, which is the category above, which is probable carcinogen includes mobile phone use and also working overnight so shift based work that's crazy to me the whole world the media and people have been told that drinking aspartame and they've kind of missed out this the context of you know how much 12 cans of this a day is crazy that's three over three liters of coke you don't have to be an expert to recognize that you shouldn't really be doing that anyway. The danger is always in the dosage, and I think that that's, you can't really sell, oh yeah, by the way, aspartame might be carcinogenic. It doesn't get clicks. We've got to understand that the media wants you to get onto their website, to pay their subscriptions. You know, a lot have, got, a lot have gone onto that subscription model now where you have to pay to read their stories. And like I said, this Reuters article was the best one. I don't think you have to pay for that. So this isn't a sponsored post at all or video. Um, but what's very interesting about this article is it debates it. So this is where I got a lot of the original information, um, including the mobile phone use and the overnights uh, information from this. Also eating red meat is in that same list, uh, the probable list, but again, I'm not trying to demonize anything here. I'm not saying that we shouldn't eat red, red meat or we shouldn't use our phones and we shouldn't work overnights. You know, these are things that are, you know, of increased risk. 
but we have to live, define your life on what might potentially be more risk and what might not. Obviously make a calculated decision, but live the life that you wanna live. So what does this mean moving forwards? Now, to be honest with you, this isn't going to change much about my lifestyle. I'm still gonna to continue to drink Coke Zero. I enjoy it, it helps with the sustainability of my diet. Um, it allows some normality and routine when I'm out with my friends, socializing, celebrating. And these are all areas where you would stray from your diet normally. So for me, I don't like drinking my calories. Like I can think it's a waste of my calories. That's a personal thing. But if you enjoy a normal Coca-Cola as well, other drinks are available. But if you enjoy a normal Coke, that's fine. Have that, but factor it into your calories. So for me, it's not gonna change anything. And personally, you're well within your right to make your own decision based off this video. But I don't think it should change anything for you either. There simply isn't enough evidence to suggest that at the moment. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach all of the references that I've used for this video in the link below. You can read all of this and come to your own conclusion. But I think it's very important that you do that before you make any life altering decisions because what this does is if you're not consuming sugar, you think that's evil. If you're not consuming sweetener, you think that's evil. It creates this very poor relationship with food because ultimately we have to accept that these things are part of our lives. We have to accept that sugar and refined foods are a massive part of our society, a massive part of our culture, a massive part of the way that we behave. And just simply eliminating them will more often than not lead you to poor eating and food related habits, which can lead to binge eating, eating disorders, and all of these sorts of things, which are ultimately more detrimental than consuming a rare can or having some sugar every now and then. Also, there I'll link in the rats and cancer scare study, because that's basically where a lot of this has come from. Um, a long time ago, I'll find out the exact date, the, there was some research done with uh, rats, aspartamine, and that's kind of where a lot of this has come from. So it does need further research, but we have to understand that we're not rats. And the dosages that cause the increased risk of cancer, relatively speaking, are what I referenced earlier. You would have to consume six, uh, sorry, 12 to 32 cans a day. That's a ludicrous amount of soft drinks or low calorie alternatives to be able to consume that much of aspartamine per day as well, not just once, per day. So I won't be changing anything. I don't think you should, but I thought this was a very interesting and needed video because so many of my clients and people reached out to me to ask me my opinion on it and whether I should be changing things. But I hope this video has helped. I hope the information below has helped. Please like, comment your thoughts below. Subscribe for more videos as always and click that bell to be notified when the next one's here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.